Right now, you're listening to the Azeem Digital Asks podcast, the podcast where I, Azeem, talk to some of the top marketers in the industry, find out everything about them, how they got to where they are today, and more importantly, sharing some really useful marketing tips that will help everybody listening to this become better marketers. Stay tuned for another great episode. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Azim Digital Asks podcast. My guest on this episode is the awesome Luke from Rise at Seven. That's not his actual last name. I will let him give himself a proper introduction shortly. But in his own words, he describes himself as coming from a tiny town, the first of his family to go to university. So he'd like to share how he comes up with cool campaign ideas. Luke, thank you very much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. So that was a bit of a naff introduction. So I'll let you introduce yourself properly. Go for it. No, I think you nailed it. Um, yeah, so my name's Luke Cope. I'm a senior digital strategist at an agency called Rise at Seven. Uh, I've been in the industry for eight or nine years now, worked in various different companies, mostly agency sides, but I've also worked at, you know, um, subscription-based startup companies. I've run my own business for a couple of years. So I'm getting to the point now where I've kind of been around the block a bit in digital. Nice. So before we dig into your background and how you got into the industry, I wanted to ask you uh, a sort of an icebreaker question. I want to know who was your childhood actor or actress crush and why? So there's a couple. Um, the first one's Jess- Jessica Rabbit, who I'm aware is a cartoon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the second is Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman. So both of these answers make me sound like a little bit weird and I hadn't really planned on exposing my fetishes in the first two minutes of a podcast but uh, <laughs> that is that is what I've done so yeah I think there were I remember watching Roger Rabbit loads and I think Jess Rabbit was just yeah my first crush nice okay we won't dig any further into nah, that probably we'll crack on <laughs> we'll crack on and we'll talk about yourself so you mentioned there in your own introduction that you, you've been in the industry for a while now when did you realize that marketing was going to be the career for you so I did I did do a degree in marketing um but like most people I had no real idea what I wanted to do even then. Um, I went freelance really early on. So not long after finishing uni, I went freelance. Uh, the options were to, I couldn't really afford to move to London. I couldn't even afford to set myself up there. And all my, all my friends went down that way. Um, it was, so that was kind of off the cards for me. Um, so I decided to go freelance. Uh, I was started off sort of managing social media profiles for local companies, uh, freelance writing. And I managed to get some good freelance writing gigs out of it. So I was writing for Top Man and Siemens and some decent companies early on. Um, but I think when I got my first check from freelancing is when I realized I wanted to do it. So the feeling of getting money off my own back, I think it was only 120 pounds or something, but, and it was actually a check as well, which is very old school now. (laughs) So I think, I think that was the moment. And then I kind of stumbled into digital marketing during the time of penguin and panda penalties. And I joined an agency called Cuba and Sheffield because they needed someone who could write content and earn links. And that kind of, they let me grow it into a content marketing offering from there. And I think, I found something that would probably be in my top three jobs that I could realistically do, I think. And I, I failed as a script writer as well. So it was, I had no choice really. Yeah. So that's interesting. So thinking back, so if you could go back and give yourself a bit of advice when you first started in the industry, knowing what you know now, what advice do you think you'd give yourself? I think one one piece of advice would probably be to to follow the work and not the money. So I kind of bottled joining a bigger agency in Leeds or Manchester when I was a bit younger, which probably would have been better work for me, but short term, maybe financial loss. Um, to be fair, I had more ownership in a smaller agency, but it's so important to work on really good work when you're younger and you just learn much more from it. So definitely follow the work and not the money. And secondly, I'd probably tell myself to enjoy it, <laughs> be more in the moment. Yeah. Um, I was so ruthless and sort of busy in my early 20s and late 20s that I didn't really stop and enjoy it and re- retrospectively look back on how I was doing. Uh, I was always kind of living five years ahead in my head. Um, so I'm not sure I stopped enough to enjoy the little wins along the way. So I think that's probably another thing I'd tell myself. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. A lot of similarities I've seen in myself. I was always thinking a couple of years ahead. So definitely one that resonates with me. What do you think you've learned from your working career then? I think all sorts, like not just in the volume of actual things I've learned during digital around SEO, like all yeah. the geeky analytics platforms I now know how to use. There's things like that that you kind of take for granted over the years of what you learn. But also having worked in agencies, which means you're exposed to how clients, other clients' companies work, what's important to them. 
uh, it's really an accelerated learning curve. But I've also worked in you know, B2B specific agencies. So now I'm, I know how B2B world compares to B2C. I've worked for a subscription model startup in Jack's Flight Club, which was just like a ridiculously profitable model. Um, and I've also you know, ran my own business for a couple of years. So I learned how to graft, how to win on your own, but also how to fail and get back up and carry on. I think the biggest thing really is like I've learned how to kind of understand how people consume marketing and content now and how that's changed over the years. So people are fairly numb towards like traditional advertising now. It's all about stories that are interesting to them. And that's kind of what we do. And it's what we do now at like Prize at Seven, the agency I'm at, is kind of create stories. And at the moment, it's search. So this is a channel that get the benefits from those stories uh, by getting them onto the right sites. So I think understanding that mindset and then understanding how to measure what we do as well. Um, I think that's a big thing I've learned. I've also learned how to blag it on occasions as well. I think definitely, <laughs> definitely something I've learned over the years. <laughs> yeah, you, you do need to have that skill. Absolutely. So you mentioned in the notes for the show that you met Carrie and Stephen about six months ago where you quit your job at another agency the next day after meeting them. I imagine that they will be two big sources of inspiration for you. Who inspires you in the industry other than Carrie and Stephen? <laughs> I think the the answer I've prepped is purely Gary and Stephen, which is, uh, <laughs> which is worrying. Um, so tell tell me about that meeting. What happened? Yeah, I think yeah. So I've I, after Christmas, I kind of had the I think like a lot of people do. I was like, oh, I'm going back to work after the Christmas break. I was commuting four hours a, a day to Headingley from Sheffield, which was just wow. crazy crazy amount of time to be spending on trains. Um, so yeah, we I met Gary and Stephen. For a, for a drink, I had met me and Carrie had followed each other on social media for a few years, and I actually attended one of her talks in Sheffield and walked in a bit late. And she pointed at me and said, "Oh, there's someone who knows about link building." I sort of turned behind me as if to say, "What me?" Um, <laughs> but I went out for a meal with them then, and that was a few months before this meeting. And then, so yeah, one day I messaged Carrie after Christmas and said, um, "I want to work with you. Can, can I come in for a for a meeting?" They were only over the river from me in, in Sheffield, and it made sense just to. To, to meet them why why wouldn't i um so yeah we had it we had a drink we had a good chat it wasn't really what i'd consider an interview but a drink and a good chat and then afterwards I'm, i messaged them and saying i'm quitting my job tomorrow so you better hire me and then <laughs> and then the next day i handed my notice in i think she thought i was joking to start with but then the, you know the guilt trip worked and i think the the deal we had was me attend, attending attending a pitch and if we won the pitch then I got a job and that was quite awkward to say to my current agency when they asked where I was going to because <laughs> uh, wow. I didn't really have a job lined up um, but then a week, luckily a week before that they phoned me and said we can offer you a job anyway um, so yeah I mean it, it, there are other people in the industry but I think I don't really have to look too far in, in Carrie and Stephen really because not and not just because they sat 10 meters away from me um, <laughs> because you know Stephen was a director at Branded Three at like 26, so that's always something I've used as a benchmark. Um, not it shouldn't matter how old you are, how many years on CV you have. Um, I've forgiven him for not hiring me back in his Branded Three days as well. After I had had his view <laughs> with him, um, so yeah, I think he's like he's knowledgeable not only in SEO but everything he talks about really. And then Carrie's like Carrie; she's like the most enthusiastic person I've ever met, uh, and like you know is. As much as being in your mid twenties, female business owner shouldn't really be a big deal. You know, we're in an industry that's predominantly run by white middle age, uh, middle aged white males, and what yeah. she's done is something to be acknowledged when you consider that. And built a business that's turned over one point five million in the first year, which is just crazy. And just through determination and permanent personal branding, and you know, the occasional tweet. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Somebody I would absolutely love to get on the podcast. So if you are listening, Curry and Stephen as well, we could probably do a two in one episode. Let's make it happen. But yeah, I mean, definitely impressive journey that you've had and definitely uh, very sort of, I can't think of the right word. What a brave move to make, just quitting your job the next day after meeting them. Reck reckless, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's probably the right word. So, I mean, in your current role now, what's the biggest challenge that you've got and how are you facing it, overcoming it? I think it sounds unusual given the current climate, but I'd say scaling at the pace we are is the biggest challenge. So keeping that level of quality while scaling at this pace, growing a team, growing the, the strategy offering. So, and that how we communicate that, that to our clients. We have like plans to expand to the US as well. 
So, you know, how we go about doing that is a big challenge. Um, so these are all like good challenges to face, I guess, but they're all things that, you know, we may not have really done before. It's exciting, but it's also a massive challenge. And for me that within that there's, you know, scale in the actual digital strategy team as we grow, getting a consistent offering for all the clients, no matter who's working on them. Um, I think to overcome that so far, we've been hiring good people, like hiring the right people. And also think that a big part of what we, what you do at any agency, if you just do good work, then everything else is going to fall into place. So I think being an advocate for the quality of the work we do uh, is a big thing and making sure that that's right as we scale at the ridiculous pace that we're scaling up. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And you mentioned at the start of your answer there, the current climate, I assume you are referring to COVID. So let's talk a little bit about that. How did it affect you? How have you responded to it? Or how are you responding to it? Because it's not really over, is it? Yeah, exactly. I think initially we were a bit panicked. I think everyone was, but like literally everyone in the industry was. Um, but to be honest, like we've, I think we've retained all our clients. We've expanded too. We've hired 10 or 12 people during, since lockdown and I think maybe more. So today's our first day in the, in our new office and I've not met half the company in person before. Um, so again, it, we know we know it here, and it's more the external stuff that it hit in terms of personal life. I think that so I was concerned about working from home because I've worked from home before, and that's not been easy in the past. But actually, this time it's been pretty good because we've been so busy. I've not really had time to think about it. Uh, it made things a lot simpler in a way. Like I said before Christmas, I was commuting like four hours a day, so for me, it, it made things a lot simpler. But yeah. more the more the ex- external impact, I think the the uncertainty, what's going to happen. Um, I think that'll, that'll impact anyone's mental state. But I think in short, we've responded by hiring. So it's actually like a good news thing to come out of it with some of those people who might have been furloughed, others were looking for something else. And actually hiring people who had been a bit unlucky has been a pretty good feeling that's come out of it. So Definitely. I couldn't agree with you more. It sounds like it's pretty much been a big learning curve for everybody, even as you've rightly mentioned yourself, who someone who has worked from home before. So in terms of learning and then personal development, how are you continuing to learn and gain knowledge in order to sort of stay on top or keep on top of everything that's happening in the industry? I think first things first, I sort of, you you can't admit to knowing everything that's going on in digital because you just don't. I feel like if you've you've had 10 years experience, but for the past three years, you've had your feet up, you're not kept, kept up to date, then digital moves so fast that you can become an empty suit pretty quickly. Um, so I think every every day an agency like Rise of Seven really you learn and you learn then apply. So every campaign is a learning curve. The the reporting for each campaign itself falls under my team team's remit. So there's a lot of measuring how things have gone and why that's been and and, and that helps you kind of stay on top. Obviously, attending talks, reading they're a big part of it. And that's, that's something that I've kind you kind of always do really. But the best way to learn is still to test and try things. I think I've always done that really even when in the early days, if I was at a place of work and they weren't willing to try something, I'd just do it in my spare time and then I'd prove the concepts almost. So yeah. I think, yeah, just learning and applying constantly. Definitely. That's a great answer. I think it will definitely resonate with the listeners. You mentioned um, in your notes for the show before about winning and how you started off winning, got to a head of digital position by the age of 30 and how you failed at things, in your own words, failed miserably at things in between. So, Thinking specifically about the last 12 months, what's been the biggest failure for you and why do you think it happened? I think it was probably just about 12 months ago now that I decided to kind of put the business I'd set up on hold indefinitely. So I'd, I'd set up a company called Brew Social in probably around 2017. Again, I'd qu- quit my job one morning and decided to go for it. I didn't have much money. Uh, all my clients and the people I, that knew me in the agency world really were at my old agency. Um, but what I did to try and invest was time and loads of it. So I wanted a new challenge and I, I got one. Um, I, I got it to the point basically where most people would think it was safe to launch. So that, But that took me 12 months. So I'd built up the clients. I'd gathered money in the business account to the detriment of my own personal finances, really. Um, you know, and I had I had wins along the way, So, but sometimes they were hard to define. So I had pictures at parts of Google and Sega that I'd gotten off my own back um, you know, there was just me and I had a couple of interns at one point, but finishing in the top two or three means you still didn't win the business. Um, so it took a big toll on me. I was used to winning. Like I said, I'd sort of been on a bit of a roll in the early, early part of my industry, in early, early part of my career. Uh, and then, yeah, I went for a period of just not winning. The things weren't coming off. The business wasn't taking off. I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, 
So about this time last year, I got offered a head of digital role at an agency, which I decided to take. Uh, and in a way, I probably wouldn't have been offered that role if I hadn't set up a business and gone for those kind of things because it just kind of resonate with other business owners, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it didn't work out. I failed because I ran out of time and money, really. Like nobody really, like I said, no, nobody really knew me in the industry at that time. And to be honest, the, the business side of running a business ruined it a bit for me. The chasing the invoices, the dealing with accountants and banks, and it really sort of the fun out of it for me to the point where I considered nearly packing in digital marketing, to be honest. So I mean, there's loads of reasons why it probably didn't work out, but um, I'm glad for it now in a way. At the time, I probably wasn't. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. I mean, if you're considering just packing in digital marketing completely, it must have had some toll. But if you look at where you are now and all the things you've achieved, it sounds like you've really bounced back. So hopefully that success continues. Speaking a little bit more then about where you are now, um, appreciate you can't go into specifics, but can you share with the listeners some of the things that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to in some areas, but yeah, some of them I just can't. <laughs> I mean, as a company, there's so much going on. We're, we're doing, you know, there's visual cool pieces on the horizon that we're doing around the best sort of stargazing uh, locations in the US. We're pushing out a piece for a client this week on where we part with, partner with a private number plate provider to to gain access to their internal search data, which means we've got around like 2 million internal searches around what people are searching for number plates. So wow. we pulled loads of angles and around popular football teams, most popular posh postcodes in London and things like that. I mean, other people in the team have been, they've recently launched a Royal Caravan campaign for Park Dean where they've done they've done up a caravan for royalty basically and got a lookalike of the queen there and everything. So it's just there's always just some crazy stuff going on in the background. I think <laughs> I'm working on a couple of things. I mean, really cool things, new business wise that, I mean, some of them are so exciting, but I'm not, I can't actually talk about them, which is disappointing. But if they come off, then we'll be shouting about them. Um, that was some of the first ideas I pitched when I joined Rise. So I'm just sort of desperate to get them off the ground as good as possible. Nice. Well, yeah, definitely good luck with that. And secretly, I was hoping for a bit of an exclusive, but unfortunately, <laughs> Sorry. you're too good, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's swap roles for a minute and imagine you've got the chance to ask yourself a question that I've not asked you. What would that be? I think, I think I'd probably ask, I'd probably ask myself something to do with imposter syndrome. Like how, how do you, how do you overcome imposter syndrome? Cause I think it's, would you agree? It's something that's like prevalent in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. So the floor is yours. How do you overcome <laughs> it? So I think, yeah, I mean, you quickly realize everyone gets it. Um, but I think in particular, like I said, for me, I was from a very small town, not a wealthy background. And I feel like, that imposter syndrome can be amplified depending on your background. So, I mean, in particular, when I was running a business, I was having meetings in London. I, I could sometimes, this is how we, I can sometimes smell the money in the room and not and not only about the, the figures we were kind of talking about, but you kind of get the impression that some of the people in the room are not from the same background as you. Uh, and then you get the little voice in your head that says, you know, what if they knew who you really were? You know, would they still want to work with you and that kind of stuff? And I think like having Sunday dinner at my parents is a vastly different world to the one I work in. And it's something that never really bothered me until I started moving up the chain a bit career-wise. Uh, I almost felt a bit guilty, to be honest, like I shouldn't be doing this thing that I'm doing and mostly enjoying. I must be blagging it, uh, you know, as I said, which, which is only partially true. Um, so, I mean, to put things in, to put, I think how you overcome it is basically putting things into perspective. Like everyone's from, everyone's in the same boat. Even if, you've, even if you're feeling it badly, you usually feel a lot better about yourself after you're putting yourself in these uncomfortable situations and overcoming it, whether that's like a presentation or anything really. Um, but yeah, it's something that I've, I can retrospectively look on, look back on now and think, yeah, it is, it, it is a bit of a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think everybody has to have that sort of moment where, as you described it, where you, you have that little voice in your head that says, well, you know, what if they knew or what if this and what if that, that mm. moment of self-doubt kind of helps you to put everything back into perspective and definitely overcome it but yeah definitely interesting to hear that and i think there's going to be a lot of valid things in that that people will take away so i uh, hope so yeah brilliant speaking about things that people can take away if you could give one tip or piece of advice to any marketers listening to do their jobs better or to help them to do their jobs better what would that be i think it would be you keep learning and applying like constantly if someone doesn't want to do something you want to do then go away and try it on something you can do in your spare time, prove the concept, learn how to do it, and then bring it to the table in your actual job. Um, definitely that, and I'd say take risks. Uh, it's an easy thing to say, harder thing to do, but 
most of the time I've taken a risk, it's paid off. Like like I said, I met Carrie and Stephen for a pint, quit my job. They hadn't got a job to offer me. Luckily, the, it, it worked. And I, if, but if I'd have stayed safe, they perhaps wouldn't have hired me or I perhaps have lost my job during the pandemic, like my old job. So I think keep learning inside and outside of the office and take these calculated risks. Definitely. Nothing more to add. Plus one. Brilliant answer. <laughs> and I think if anybody's thinking about taking a risk, listen to this episode talk to Luke Cope. Honestly, if you want to take a risk, Luke's the man to talk to. <laughs> so coming to the end, sadly, really enjoyed recording this episode. I've just got one more question to ask you. Technically two, but one official. You need to get into maximum productivity. What are you listening to? What's your favourite song, artist, playlist? What's in your ears? Um, I listen to, if I need to like actually do proper work, I'll listen to the gr- uh, Gorillas, which is weird because I'm not a huge fan of theirs, but there's something about the beats of their song that I, just, I can work better when I'm listening to them. Um, so mm-hmm. Gorillas and uh, I mean, listen to Jerry Cinnamon at the moment, like constantly. So th- those two I'd probably say are up there. Nice, nice. It's definitely interesting to hear from different marketers what they listen to. There's such a mix of all sorts of genres. You've got people who've said opera, uh, piano music then you've got proper like hard rock music all sorts of stuff it's it's interesting how different people are i never understand how people can listen to like heavy metal or drum and bass or something at work i just can't can't do it no (laughs) definitely not because i need to listen for me i need to listen to something passively so i just there's a playlist on spotify called uh, music for concentration or piano concentration i just stick that on just yeah. to have a bit of background noise and something I can passively listen to. But if I need some some sort of music, it'll be pretty much anything really, but just not like heavy rock or heavy metal. No yeah. chance. Yeah, exactly. rocking out at my desk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, thanks very much for being a brilliant guest on the show. If people want to find out more about you or get in touch with you, how can they do that? I mean, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as uh, Copazade. My name's Luke Cope. You can obviously search me and find me on those platforms. Anything Rise at 7 post out um, is a good way to keep up to date with the work we're doing as well. So yeah, those two platforms as well. But yeah, thanks a lot for having me. I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Not a problem. You've been a great guest. Thank you very much for taking the time out, especially when you're now back in the office. I will leave the last word on this episode to you, Luke. Thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate it. So that was another great episode in the bag. I'm really enjoying hearing from some brilliant people in this industry. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow me on Spotify. Please leave a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you are using. Tell a friend to tell a friend and hopefully see you for the next episode.